Howdy. Yeehaw. <clears throat> I'm getting uh, commercials now. Howdy, partner. We start now. We're getting commercials. Yeehaw. I'm going to mention it again at the end. <clears throat> Uh, I'll mention now and at the end again. Guys, please do pray for me. September 26th, 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. I can be finally released or this bondage can be extended for another month. If I'm released tomorrow, then I have the freedom to relocate. And if it's extended without getting a decision, then that means I may be delayed for another month. And I'm hoping that the Lord Jesus will be pleased to just release me, right? Just Get out of this and start a new life and trust that God will provide for me and my daughters and will bring my daughters to me. So can you guys say special prayers tonight? The Lord will be with me and guide me and just set me free. I can be free completely just to serve Jesus, right? And know that he, he fights for my kids, loves my children, my daughters, and will protect them and bring them to my life. So I can be in theirs and be Christ to them. So I need a lot of prayers tonight. Please, tomorrow's the big day. In fact, if it wasn't because of tomorrow, I wouldn't have come back. <clears throat> I would have been in L.A. and other areas. Okay. We're going to wait a few more minutes. <clears throat> I'm going to answer a question by Zena and Lord willing, if that coward Mark Cyril comes. And the reason why I treat him harshly, let me tell you why. Because the coward accused me of being a coward, and I was afraid. And you guys know my policy, right? My policy is you're not going to take the comment section of my YouTube videos and turn them into a debate forum where you post reams of ranting, you know, what I call 50,000 word posts, because I don't have the time to sit and read through these posts because believe it or not, folks, I have a life, right? I have to do a lot of reading, researching, <clears throat> you know, objections by Muslims, by Jehovah's Witnesses, cults, you know, and other things. So I don't have time and I have my own personal issues, my daughters who need a father, to be Jesus to them, you know, a corrupt judicial system used of the devil, a corrupt, wicked judge filled with the devil, right? So I have a lot on my plate, but in spite of it all and my failures, Jesus Christ, my Lord, by his grace and mercy, is sustaining me, filling with the spirit and by his blood, I pray he cleanses me and purifies me to walk holy because it's a struggle, fleshly desires, <clears throat> anger issues, impatience, not knowing what tomorrow brings. So. Do not use the comment section to turn into a debate thread where you post 50,000 word comments. You're going to get blocked. Okay. So why don't you make, make that clear? <clears throat> so if he shows up, <clears throat> I'm going to decimate his shameless butchering of the Bible because he's already made up his mind. Animals can't have souls and spirits. Even when he says he has souls, he doesn't mean they have a soul. It means that they breathe. I hope he shows up because he'll give me an opportunity to show why not everyone should presume to be a teacher because this guy's rant was pitiful how he distorted scripture. Mark Cyril, I'm mentioning by name so no one ever listens to you until you repent. And for calling me a coward, I'm going to then stoop to your level and give you a taste of your medicine. If you come to me lovingly, kindly, humbly, and want me to hear your case out and respond, I'll do it. But when you accuse me of being a coward, then that's it. That means you think you know your stuff. Right. No, I think he was on yesterday under an alias and didn't want to speak out. I'm hoping he does because his rant was so pitiful. It was so disgusting how he perverted the scriptures and he thinks he's responding. See, folks, let me tell you something. Anyone can respond. I've been doing this for 20 years. I have Muslims writing articles full of just responses that are fluff and rants that don't refute anything because anyone can get an answer. But how many people can give an answer that's solid, that's factual, correct, and actually refuting you? Not many. Right. So we'll wait a few minutes. Right. And then <clears throat> I'm trying to learn from Michael Brown did an excellent discussion. Michael Brown now stated that for the foreseeable future, he's not going to respond to his critics. Right. He's not going to respond to his critics. He's tired of being misrepresented. He's tired of trying to be gracious and extend an olive branch and invite these brothers who disagree with his views to have a dialogue, but they choose to then talk behind his back, misrepresent him. He goes, I'm done. And he goes, most successful ministries do not respond and address critics. So now pray for me that I follow that example. 
that when I have these dogs ranting and, and, and raving and just foaming at the mouth, I block them, ignore them, and not even address them. That is hard, but I know by the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give me the grace to exercise self-control and self-constraint because it's not worth it. What's worth it is answering sincere questions by sincere people who want sincere answers. <clears throat> Believe me, Corn Chandler, I perfectly understand where he's coming from. The problem with me is I have an issue, and I'm being honest. That's why I need prayers. For some reason, when I get challenged, I get angry, and I have to respond. And I think that's just one of the symptoms. And I'm not trying to be psych a psychologist and blame it on my upbringing. But believe it or not, guys, it's the honest truth. Satan knows this. Uh-oh, here we go, Hater Wood with attention. Everyone, give him attention. Keep it up, Hater Wood. You're not going to get your package, Hater. Anyway, he's, he's a perfect example, by the way, Hater Wood. He's a perfect example of what I'm about to say. Believe it or not, guys, believe it or not, your upbringing, your upbringing will affect how you respond, will shape your personality, how you react, your upbringing. Satan knows this. Satan knows if he can attack families, create dysfunctional homes, the children will be affected and they will grow up to be like David Wood, quite dysfunctional. But we serve a God who's almighty, who's real, and has the power to transform, heal, and save. And the Lord in his mercy is healing us until he restores us and frees us from these imperfections, the dysfunctionality. But in God's wisdom, he doesn't do it overnight. It's a process. And in God's wisdom, he allows us to struggle with certain quirks in order to keep us humble and at his feet, trusting in him. Right? So until the Lord gives me victory, this is my, my issue, my area. Right? My struggle. People like Hater would come, try to bully me, and I've always dislike being bullied right make me lose my temper and then i attack and say you see sam sam nobody loves you sam that's david Wood. hey the greatest motivational speak speaker the world has never heard <clears throat> not sam you know see you quit being a jerk and you're gonna get a thousand people watching you quit being a jerk man he's so motivational uplifting all right hey by the way uh david they're coming out with your movie god willing friday they're coming out with your movie, <clears throat> The Joker, because everything that comes out of you is nothing but a joke. <laughs> All right. With that said, guys, I got to at least get my live stream up to at least 200, man. That's not too much ass, right, by the grace of God? This guy who who's a cure to insomnia, David Wood, who puts people to sleep, cures their insomnia, gets about 1,000. Come on, man. Even apostate prophet, 1,500. What's up? Got to work it, work and get more people for the glory of Jesus. All right. I don't think that coward's going to show up. And I'm going to answer this question, and then we're going to go into the topic. One second, guys. I got to open the door. Hold on. Someone needs attention. Hold on. David, entertain them as I open the door. Sorry, guys. I have to open the door. Anyway, um, with that said, I forgot what I was saying. Hater would keep... Stay away from the hatred. Okay, folks, let's let's start just glorifying the Lord. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Again, Father, I ask that you just please have mercy on us and be patient with us and give us the grace to be patient with one another. Crucify our flesh and destroy the fruit of our flesh and fill us with life and fruit and power from your Holy Spirit, your beautiful Spirit, Father, and cleanse us and purify us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, Father. Father, please help me to overcome my flesh and my shortcomings, not to succumb, but to resist and crucify my flesh. And I, and I ask this for all of us, Lord. Give us the power to die to our flesh and walk in the life and the victory of the Holy Spirit, Father. And forgive us when we willfully succumb to the flesh or even in struggling, we still succumb. Father, deliver us for your glory. Help us to become more like Jesus in holiness, in purity, in love and worship. And Father, fill me now with wisdom and knowledge by your Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ by interpreting scriptures correctly with wisdom from your Spirit. Save me from error and stammering, Father. <clears throat> Bless everyone present to understand the things that come from your Spirit and give them wisdom and knowledge to go deep in scriptures. Open our minds and our hearts and our eyes to the beauty of scripture and give us the power to live out your word for the glory of Jesus, Father. May we decrease, may Christ increase, Father. And Father, just fill my lungs and chest and throat with health that I need to glorify you. And bless everyone in need. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters and preserve them 
and your love and cover them by the blood of Jesus and fill them. And all the, those who have needs and family members who need to be filled with the Spirit, fill us with the Spirit, Father, and have your way and save us from attacks of the enemy. And Father, please be with me tomorrow, a big day. Set me free for your glory, for the glory of Jesus, to be used by your Spirit more freely. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Be with us in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Hopefully we get close to 200. Okay, I'm going to answer the first question. <clears throat> we have a sister here. Pray for her. Her name's Shami. And yeah, and guys, pray that tomorrow I will have my freedom in Jesus' name because here's what's on the agenda. Lord willing, David Wood and I will be hooking up. I'll be hooking up with him to do more live shows. And hopefully we'll start doing shows with Rashid. Pray for that. And I need to get into the gym. Even though I've been doing cardio, I haven't been able to hit the weights because David Wood wants me to get my muscles back, my guns, so I can do Halal Hogan in the Boom Boom Room. So God willing, if everything is clear and I'm free, I'm going to be appearing in Muhammad's Boom Boom Room because David has a desire to get all of us killed. He wants the Muslims to put a hit on us to get all of us killed because to do Muhammad, that's instant death. So that's how much David loves us. He loves us so much that he wants us to receive a martyr's crown. He wants us to be martyred. And you know what's beautiful? Let me just say something. God has really raised up some fearless warriors. David Wood is fearless. And I, I hate to compliment this guy because he's already puffed up. Volcab Malone is a warrior. John, what do you mean, is a warrior. Adam Coleman is a warrior. Because these guys are willing to go anywhere, do anything, to see Muslims get saved and Jesus glorified, even if it means getting killed. So pray for them and their families and pray for me that I can be as bold as them. But he has a, he has a wish to get us all killed. And so I'm going to be appearing in the boom boom room, Lord willing, sooner than later. And I pray he sets me free tomorrow. Right? Right? Where I'm going to appear as the black stone in the boom boom room, Halal Hogan, because I got to get my muscles back. So pray I get in the gym sooner than later. And also as Sam Shamoon meeting Muhammad. Halal Hogan, Sam Shamoon, and then the Black Stone. So pray for that, right? Okay. By the way, David, uh, Andrew Martin, let me just tell you something about him, David. Andrew Martin is one of those atheists who's in love with Jesus. He loves the Bible. He loves Jesus Christ. He lo loves Christian theology, and he loves refuting Islam. Because Andrew Martin... God is opening his heart. Sooner or later, he's going to be worshiping Jesus because he loves Christ too much to remain an atheist. And David, Andrew Martin just said, you got to bring Aisha into the boom boom room. Friend, that's already in the works. Aisha is going to make a special appearance. So keep praying for him, David. Okay, now with that said, <clears throat> are we ready? Are we ready? I want to answer this question. It's a good question. Thank our brother. Thank our brother, Protestant believer, a dear brother, precious to my heart. All of you are, even first and last. I love this brother for serving me to serve you. He's going to post verses. Here was the question. Zina asked me, are there prophets after the Lord Jesus Christ? <clears throat> now, some people said no. Actually, you're wrong. There are. There are prophets after Jesus Christ. Let me prove it. Are you now ready for the evidence? Zina, are you ready? As you're praying that the Spirit fills me to glorify Christ. All right. Are you ready? Okay. First proof that there are prophets after Jesus Christ our Lord. Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. And guys, please make sure you focus on the passages. Don't get distracted with people who come here who are going to try to distract you. Focus, because I want you to learn this, absorb it, make it your own, and then share it and proclaim it. We need more people to do this and learn. Matthew 23, 34. Read this, Zena. Jesus Christ our Lord speaking. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets. Did you catch it, Zena? Right there. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets. I send unto you prophets. And wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. So how can a Christian say there are no prophets after Jesus? When in Matthew 23, 34, our Lord Jesus said, I will send you prophets. Now, Zena and everyone else, here's my question. Sunil Linus, God bless you, but Protestant believers going to post, so please. 
Just let him do it. And God bless you for serving. No, Andrew, it's talking about future. Did you see? This is what you're going to do to them. How can they do something to them, right, if it's not future? I'm going to send you, Andrew. And this is what you're going to do to them. How can it be passed? Are you with me there, Andrew? The entire context is I'm going to send you my inspired emissaries that you're going to mistreat, thereby bringing the wrath upon you and Jerusalem. Did everyone understand this is not past? It's future? And Zina, are you getting it? I want to make sure you see Jesus sending prophets. I hope Zina is listening because this was for her benefit. Okay, now here's a question for Zina and everyone else. Okay, here's a question. How can Jesus in heaven send prophets on earth when that's something that the Old Testament says only God can do? Only God sends prophets on earth as God is in heaven. But notice what Jesus said. I will be sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. How can Jesus claim to do the very thing that God does in heaven when Jesus is in heaven? Are you with me there? No, the Arabian prophet is not a fake CP. He's just using that name because he likes it. So do you see? We prove two things, Zina. Number one, Jesus is God. And number two, he's the God of the prophets who sends prophets after he goes to heaven. Right? Everyone got that? Are you listening? F focus. Don't be distracted. Focus. Okay. Is Are there other passages that speak of prophets? Yes. You ready? Let's go to Acts 15, 32. It has the same meaning that it does in the rest of the Old Testament and New Testament. If I have to define it, we're going to have problems. Okay. Acts 15.32. Watch here. Just pay attention, Cousin Brian. And Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves. This is after Christ. He's in heaven. Prophets working alongside the apostles like Peter, James, John. Well, J James was killed at this time. Peter, John, and Paul. And Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirm them. Yeah, and hit the like button, man. Come on, make me go viral. I'm getting envious of David Wood. So Judas and Silas, two prophets, right? Okay. Acts 13, verses 1 to 2. Acts 13, verse 1, but we're going to read 2 as well. Okay? All after Jesus. Acts 13, verses 1 and 2. Watch. Choose Jesus. Let me not answer that now. We're going to go off topic. Let's just see whether there were prophets during the time the apostles were alive as they were receiving revelation and writing scripture. Let's focus on that for now. Acts 13, verses 1 to 2. And now there was in the church that was at Antioch, meaning Sir, uh, Syria, Antioch, Syria, certain prophets and teachers. So notice there were prophets with the apostles. <clears throat> right? Certain prophets and teachers. As Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord, pay attention, verse 2, verse two ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, so the Holy Spirit is the Lord, he's God, who brings revelation to the church and speaks, showing he's a divine person. The Holy Ghost said, set apart, se separate me. Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Notice the Holy Spirit is God, the Lord of the church, who commands the church, orders the church, and tells the church what to do. He tells the prophets and the teachers at the church, I want Paul and Barnabas set apart for me for the work I'm sending them to do. Okay? Everyone there paying attention? Amen. He will be Tim Egger. I receive it for his glory. Everyone there? You got it? Acts 11, 26 to 30. We're going to look at 26 as well. Because it was in Antioch, Syria, where they were first called Christians. Acts 11, 26 to 30. Pay attention here. And when he had found them, he brought them unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets, plural. Yes, Nate. 
And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Pay attention. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, one of these prophets, Agabus, and signified by the Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit is revealing Agabus the future. He's telling Agabus what's going to happen in the future. Signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth, meaning famine, throughout the world, which came to pass. So he no, now we know he's a true prophet because his words came to pass. In the days of Claudius Caesar, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, <clears throat> determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So a prophet from Jerusalem named Agabus had the Holy Spirit revealed to him, a famine is coming, get ready. And it came to pass, confirming he received revelation from the Holy Spirit. Yes, it was, Sunil. Don't let someone tell you that Christian was a derogatory term le uh, leveled at the Believers by unbelievers. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. Now, focus. Acts 21, 8 to 11. Acts 21, 8 to 11. Zina, are you following? Okay. Acts 21, 8 to 11. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed. Luke with Paul and everyone else, and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, one of the original seven deacons appointed by the apostles, and abode with him. Now pay attention. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So female prophets, prophetesses. Now watch 10 and 11. 10 and 11. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. There goes Agabus again. He's the one mentioned in Acts 11. He came from Judea, Agabus, and when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, his belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Notice the Holy Ghost is likened to God because it's, Thus saith Jehovah, thus saith the Lord. But here it says, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, because when the Holy Ghost speaks, that's Jehovah speaking. Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Bird brings the word. You notice what you're doing now, Bird? You're tempting me to block you. You've been now engaged in a side discussion with Andrew Martin, robbing him of listening. You're going to get blocked. You know that, right? Okay. Now, let's focus. And this is a Christian that comes regularly and still disrespects the rules. And is a distraction to this young man that I want to focus on the word. Unbelievable. All right. Everyone got it? Everyone got it, right? Agabus prophesied that Paul would be imprisoned by the Jews in Jerusalem. So he's a prophet. Called the prophet and prophesied. Now that's all in the book of Acts. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29. Help me to do my thing, bird brings the word, please, for the glory of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29. We're going to read all the way to 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, but pay attention. Zena, pay attention. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, that's for you. And God hath set some in the church at the time of Paul, not the past, in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. There you go, Zena. At the church, at the time of Paul's writing, not only were there prophets, um, apostles, but prophets. Thirdly, teachers. Did you know the third in the list? People like me, teachers. After that, people do miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. That's a rhetorical question. Paul expects you to answer no. Right? Are all teachers? No. That's why Mark Cyril, that's why I'm going to muzzle you. Because you shouldn't be teaching because you pervert scriptures. Okay? Not everyone's called to be a teacher. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and I yet show you unto you a more excellent way. So not everyone will be given the gift to teach or do miracles. However, everyone is given this gift that we need to seek with all our heart and cultivate by the power of the Spirit. What's the gift that God gives everyone, wants everyone to have? 1 Corinthians 13, love. 
And he says, this is the greatest gift, love. And God wants all of you to have it, not just some of you. But he doesn't want everyone to be a teacher or a prophet or apostle or a worker of miracles. But he wants everyone to have the gift of love. That's yours for the asking and for the cultivating. 1 Corinthians 13, right? So did everyone see it? Zena, prophets are second in terms of authority. The highest authority in the church at that time are apostles, then the prophets, then the teachers. So you guys better respect me and honor me, right? You know what I'm saying? Okay, now, we're not done yet. Ephesians 2, 18 to 22, pay attention to verse 20. Ephesians 2, 18 to 22, pay attention to verse 20. Ephesians 2, verses 18 to 22, pay attention to verse 20. I'm going to probably have to change the title of discussion. New Testament prophets and Jesus' quality with the Father. Read with me, Zina. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Okay. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. You Gentiles are not severed from God. You're not strangers. You are now fellow citizens with the Jews. You are now part of God's commonwealth as people. You Gentiles. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So you Gentiles with the Jews are the household of God. Now watch here. 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together growth unto an holy temple in the Lord. So you are being built into a holy temple. We, the believers, living believers, are the temple, the house of God. Not a building with bricks. You are the temple of God, right? Right? And let's read verse 20. I skipped, I guess, 20. And are built upon... The foundation of the apostles and prophets. Did you catch it? You and I, born of the Spirit, are the church, the temple, the house of God, built on the foundation, 20, apostles and prophets. They are our foundation. How are they our foundation? Their teaching. Their revelation that God has preserved. We're built on their teaching. Notice, Zena, apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly frame together growth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. So God by his spirit lives in us, lives among us, works through us. And God by his spirit is making us a building and the foundation of us, the building, are the revelations of the apostles and prophets preserved by the spirit in the Bible. You with me there? Okay, Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 5. Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 5, specifically verse 5. Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 5, specifically verse 5. Okay, watch here. Ephesians 3. How that by revelation he made known to me, God revealed to me a mystery that he now unveiled. As I write a four in a few words, as I wrote a four in few words before. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Here's verse five. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Here he's not talking about Old Testament prophets. And I proved that already from the book of Acts and 1 Corinthians 12. He's taught about the apostles and the prophets like Agabus, like Silas and Judas, who are working with the apostles, receiving revelation from the Spirit with the apostles that they passed on to the churches. Yes, Sinus, have you been listening, bro? Sunil, I don't think you're listening. You know what happens if people don't listen? Did you just listen to Acts 15.32 where two prophets were named, Judas and Silas, or Acts 11.27-30, and Acts 21, 10 to 11, where a prophet named Agabus was mentioned explicitly. Why are you not paying attention, brother? This is not time to doze or get distracted, but focus because it's the word of God. I don't want you to pay attention to me because I don't want your attention. Pay attention to the word of God. You hear me there? They're even named Agabus, Judas, and Silas among many. Oh, Jesus, Christus, yeah, I Yep, I mean, amen, amen. Jesus Christ, who is Lord and God, amen, okay. You want me there? 
All right. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16. This I need everyone to pay attention. Thank you. Okay. Life and happiness. I want everyone to pay attention. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. By the grace of Jesus Christ, Ms. Yori, I'm no scholar of the Greek, but by the grace of God, I trained myself to be able to read Greek. Doesn't mean I recognize every word. So that's all glory to the triune God. Now read with me. Yeah, Lopez, I taught myself, but I'm not trying to boast. I boast in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yes. That's why I was reading the Greek. Zito he helada. Zito he helada. Okay. Now Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he gave some. Notice he's talking. Now it's not about Jesus building up believers to become mature men and women. To become spiritually mature. You go from babes to becoming spiritually mature. So what did he do to help us attain spiritual maturity where we're not deceived by false doctrines, false teachers? He, Jesus, gave some apostles. Not everyone's apostles. Some prophets. He sent you prophets. He sent evangelists. Some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. To make us complete, mature, lack nothing, needing no one. For the work of the ministry. So we have everything we need to serve the Lord and serve one another. For the edifying of the body of the Christ. To build believers up. Till we all come, all of us, to the unity of the faith. He gave us this so we can all be united on what the faith is. Know what the faith is. Live it out. Love it and be united. And build others, right? And of the knowledge of the Son of God, so we can know the Son of God truly and intimately. That's why he gave us these offices and these individuals. Unto a perfect man, so we become one whole, complete, perfect man. One man, perfect, complete. Unto the measure of the status of the fullness of Christ. To attain that status of maturity that Christ has assigned for us. To achieve and attain. Why? Understand what he's be being said here. Read. 14. To 16, that we henceforth be no more children. You're babes. He wants you to be men, women, mature. No more children being deceived, tossed to and fro, right? Like a boat being tossed to and fro by the wind and the waves, not knowing, should I believe this? Should I believe that? One day I believe this, tomorrow. No, no more of that. No more. No more of that, right? Right? And carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men, people using cunning to deceive you. Cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking truth and love, may all of us grow up into him in all things, which is that even Christ, to attain the full measure that Christ has given us, to be like Christ, to conform to Christ's image, to think like Christ, to live like Christ, to love like Christ. From whom? Jesus the head. He's the one as our head. He, the whole body fitly joined together. He keeps us together by his all powerful word compacted by that which every joint he supplies he feeds he nourishes every joint in his spiritual body according to the effectual working that power of his that gets results that does what god wants it to do in our lives and the measure of every part right let me finish it every part making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love now do you see why jesus why jesus Gave us apostles and prophets and teachers and and pastors, pastors and teachers, evangelists and and workers of miracles and all of this. Why? For one reason: get people saved. Once they're saved, to then make sure they go from being babes to become spiritually mature, perfect in understanding of who God is, what His will is, and then walking in His will. For his glory, no longer being babes, having people deceive us, mislead us with wrong doctrine. Because now we have the truth. We know the truth. We're convinced of the truth. And we're walking in the truth. And we understand the truth. That's why. Is that clear? You got it? I am I. I am I. Apple 10. Elada Parakolotho Ta Minteo Saskai Riti Megale Pafe Hotheas Ta Sas Yulagai Kai Kale Yugaya. All right, bro. Thanks for the Greek lesson. Thank you.
Okay, is that clear? The final chapter that says that still there are prophets to come in the future, but we're not going to read it. You can write it down. Write down Revelation 11. There it says, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Great for us, dreadful for unbelievers. The Lord Jesus is going to raise up two witnesses for 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. They will prophesy and they will do signs and wonders and miracles. They will be killed, but then God will resurrect them physically on the third day and then they'll be taken into heaven. So Revelation, if it's future, hold on. If it's future, that means we have to await at least two more prophets who will do miracles. No, not Moses and Elijah. Don't add to the text. Nowhere does it say it's Moses and Elijah. Nowhere does it say Moses and Elijah returning. That's a tradition of men. Don't buy into it. They are two unnamed prophets prophesying for three and a half years who will do miracles, who will be killed, and like Jesus, be raised physically on the third day and taken into heaven. That's a debatable issue. Is there a third temple or not? I don't want to get into that. But as far as Revelation is concerned, guys, no, it has nothing to do with 42 generations leading to Jesus. You know. Don't read too much into these passages. Tread lightly with Revelation. All we know from Revelation, let me repeat it again. All we know from Revelation, exactly, there are two lamb stands, olive trees, standing before the, the God of all the earth, right? All we know is there are two prophets. How do we know? Because they prophesy 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, right? And they do miracles, signs and wonders that resemble the miracles of Moses and Elijah. But we're not told they're Moses or Elijah. Don't add to the text. They'll be killed physically, but then raised physically and be taken in a cloud to be with God. That's it. Show what text? What are you talking about? That's it. World changer, who told you there's a rapture before the tribulation? You see what you guys are doing? You keep assuming your interpretation of the Bible, reading into it. Moses Elijah, where does it say it? Oh, pre-tribulation rapture. Where does it say that? For the record, I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I think the evidence is overwhelmingly against it. But I do believe Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. That it's a literal historical reign of Christ on earth in his glorified body for a thousand years. But that's my belief. You can agree to disagree. I'm not going to debate it. Let's focus. Let's focus. With me there? Okay. Now, Zena, you see... So many verses that there were prophets after Christ that he sent in the power of the Spirit. And there'll be at least two more if Revelation is still future. In other words, if Revelation is not about events before 70 AD, but about the return of Christ at the end of the age, there are still two prophets left at least, at the very least. Right, Zena? Yeah. I've heard that Jewish bride pattern. Don't read extra biblical tradition into the text. If the text plainly says one thing, get rid of that Jewish tradition. Don't make the Jewish tradition force passages to agree with that scheme if those passages clearly are going against that scheme where Jesus comes in, contracts marriage with his bride, goes to his father's bridal chamber, prepares the chamber at a day or hour appointed by the father, which the son doesn't know, and then he comes, takes the bride into the chamber and stays with her for seven days as proof of a pre-tribulation rapture. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, doesn't work. T-shirt, teacher. God, Lord, loosen my tongue, speak clearly. Doesn't work. Okay? Okay, medic, this is why I'm doing it. So you can train yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit to constrain yourself and focus. Okay. Now, Zena, how do we know a, the, a true prophet from a false one? Revelation 19, verse 10. Here's the key. Revelation 19, verse 10. You want me there? Everyone following? We're almost close to 200. We're 148. Praise God. Okay. Following everybody? Revelation 19, 10. Here's the key. I think I'm just going to do this and the deity of Christ. Can you do me a favor? Exactly. You don't even need to know Greek. You can know English. And Jesus is God, even in the English or Swahili. That's the beauty of the word, that in any language, 
that the Bible translated correctly, accurately, the proofs of God and the doctrines of the faith are clear and irrefutable to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear by the grace of God's spirit. Now, Revelation 19, verse 10. Read with me. Zina, read. This is how we know a true prophet from a false one. And I fell at his feet to worship him, the angel. And he said unto me, see thou, do it not. Read, Zina. Everyone else, read. I am thy fellow servant. I, an angel, am simply a servant like you and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's how you know a true prophet. A true prophet will preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ, will preach the true Jesus, the Jesus of history, who's the God man, will preach about the true God who's triune, will speak of the true spirit, right? And will not present another Jesus from the one preached by the apostles and prophets, as preserved in the Revelation, the Holy Bible, will not bring a different spirit or a different gospel. A true prophet preaches the true message preached by the prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus himself, and the apostles and prophets that Jesus sent after him, where now their revelations given by the Spirit are preserved in the Holy Bible. With me there? Zena, did you get your answer? Clear? Dennis, I answered that in a previous session that I did earlier with Hatun Tash. Go watch it on DCCI. I answered that. So go there and listen to it. Near the end, I answered that question. Okay. So if we got that out of the way, I can deal with John 530. Resurrected eyes, maybe. I don't know because I don't want to get, yeah, well, I don't know. Anyway, I mean, I don't know. There's so many issues we divided over that if I talk about this, it will lead into another attack by other people. I got attacked by some coward who wouldn't come here for me to school him and expose his shameless butchering of the Bible because he doesn't like the fact that animals are soulish, have souls and spirits, even though he lied in the previous session saying, no, I believe they have souls. No, because if you ask them, what do you mean by souls? That means they breathe. They're living beings, animate beings, and the soul refers to their breath that leaves when they die. Shameless butchering a scripture, and the coward wouldn't come for me to school him. I can't wait to do it anyway. But yeah, well, let's come back. Let's focus now. Are we now focused? Can I change gears now? Do me a favor don't ask me questions not related to the topic, and don't go into side discussions that will distract people. Focus on the message so you can learn. Now, your reason why I keep telling you focus here's why. Let me tell you why. I want you to learn this stuff. I want you to absorb this stuff, memorize this stuff, make it second nature so you can teach others, you can present it, and impact more people. That's why I want you to listen so you can learn it. We need more teachers appointed by the Spirit to know this stuff, to use it for the glory of Christ. You hear me there? But when you ask other questions or let your mind wander or get into side discussions, you're not learning. You're doing yourselves a disservice because by the grace of God, I know this stuff already. I already know it for you, right? Zena, just keep praying and keep living for Jesus and keep loving Jesus, right? And he'll come. Focus now, guys. Maybe we can come back on the Greek too. Because remember what Paul says, do not speak a tongue without an interpreter. So don't violate that part of scripture, bro. Greek is another tongue that you're not interpreting, and I don't want to interpret for you. Okay, anyway, let's focus. Now, are you ready? Now I'm going to go to John 5.30. I think I'm just going to do John 5.30. Now, guys, I hope by the grace of Jesus we get good news tomorrow. Hopefully I'm free. If I'm free, I'll try to come and do another session on John Calvin's view of the atonement. I won't do it today. I'm going to have to change the title because... Time is fleeting. Okay, so let's talk about John 5.30. Are we ready? Who's ready now? Who's ready? Because this was brought up to, by a brother, and I answered it. I think he was in the channel. Was he? Anyway, I'm going to answer it. Okay. All right, let's focus. This time it's about Christ, his relationship to the Father. It's about the Trinity. Okay. John 5.30. Let's look at it. And see how this passage is misused to prove that Jesus isn't God. Okay, let's go. Let's John 5 30. 
I can of my own self do nothing. Ah, see, Jesus ain't God. God can do whatever. Jesus can't do anything and everything. That means he's not God. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So did you catch it? Jesus can't be God. Because he says, by myself, I can't do a single thing. Imagine God speaking like that. So are you ready for the refutation? Let's see how many of you guys are serious and are ready for the refutation. I just said no foreign language, Malaya, because we can't understand foreign languages. So you need to not violate scripture, speak where we can understand or interpret. All right. Now, are you ready for the exegesis? And this is why I got upset with the brother. I said, you're disappointing me. He goes, sorry. You know why? Because he didn't think for even a second to go back and read the context. Just read the context. It'll explain itself. John 5.30. Now, if you're ready, let me explain what Jesus did not mean. And then I'm going to explain what he meant. I need it. I need it, Benny. Let me explain what he meant. Jesus did not mean that he's a creature who's limited and therefore can't be God. What Jesus was saying is, though he is God, and I'm going to prove that. Let me first explain, and then I'll prove it. He is not some independent, secondary, renegade God. In other words, he is not a separate God from the Father. He is one with the Father and the Spirit. And because he's one with them, he can never act independently. He can never act separately from the Father. Because the Godhead, the members of the Godhead, are perfectly united, inseparably united. They are perfectly one and can only do all things in perfect unity. That's all it means. Are you with me there? You understand what he's saying? As the Son, who's essentially one with the Father and the Spirit, I can never act independently from the Father and the Spirit. I can never <clears throat> do things contrary to the Father and the Spirit because as a member of the Godhead, the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit are inseparable and can only work in perfect accord and perfect union and can never act independently. Now, let me tell you the mistake of some Christians. They try to pass this off on the humanity of Jesus. That won't work. He's not talking about himself as a man. You know how I know it won't work? He's talking about himself as a member of the Godhead, as the divine son, who's now flesh, but as the son of God. You know how I know that won't work? Saying, oh, it's, it's his humanity. You know how I know? It's not referring to his humanity, his incarnation. Even though he's in the flesh at that point? Can anyone tell me how I know? Two reasons. But the most obvious one is he says the same thing about the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13. Let's read John 16, verses 12 to 13. He says the same thing of the Holy Spirit. They are one and distinct. Inseparable, but distinct. Here's how I know first and last. John 16, 12 to 13. Here's how I know. John 16, 12 and 13. You skipped 12, brother. You're, you're losing the job. I'm going to have to fire you, man. Come on. I'm not going to say you're, I'm not going to send you any paycheck. Okay, John 16, 12 to 13. Let's put it again back to back. Okay, read with me. I have yet many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. 13, watch. 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of truth will come, for he shall not speak of himself. Ah, oh, there goes the same language. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice, the spirit will not speak of his own initiative. The spirit will not speak on his own independent thinking. He'll only speak what he hears. Did you catch it? But the Holy Spirit did not become flesh. So you can't say, well, it's the Holy Spirit as flesh. The Holy Spirit did not become flesh. So what does it mean that even the Spirit will not speak on his own initiative? He won't do something on his own independently. He'll only speak what he hears. The Holy Spirit didn't become flesh. Yes, they are, medic. Suborned to him in authority, but equal to him in essence, nature, power, and glory. You with me there? You understand? So the Holy Spirit, like the Son does not act independently, right? cannot act separately, <clears throat> but only act, speak, 
work in perfect union with the other members of the Godhead. That's why it's one God. That's why it's triune. Three persons that only work in perfect union, because that's all they can do, in perfect harmony, inseparably from one another. They never act apart or independently. That's all Jesus is saying about himself and the Holy Spirit. That exactly, serrated sport. You with me there? Did we get that point thus far? Resurrected eyes, if you've been following me already, answer that in the previous live stream. Go back and listen to John 5, 26. I can't answer it now. Okay, now let me prove that's what Jesus is saying. Let me prove that's what Jesus is saying, okay, by reading the context. Now, the context is the entire chapter 5, but for the sake of time, we're going to skip. Let's read John 5, 16 to 18. Exactly Revelation 22, 13. That means there are three separate independent divine beings. Let's read John 5, 16 to 18. Let's break it down. Read with me, guys. I need your attention. I need your undivided attention. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. He healed a paralytic on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them. Look at how he defends himself. My father worketh, hit her too, works even now. And I work. See, my father's working now, even on the Sabbath, and I work. Now notice their reaction in verse 18. Notice their reaction in verse 18. Guys, read. Therefore the Jews <clears throat> sought the more to kill him, because he had not only he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now let's unpack what this means. The Jews are livid. Jesus is now justifying. Guys, pay attention. Jesus is now justifying his right to do a miracle at work on the Sabbath day on the grounds that God the Father works on the Sabbath day. What does that mean? God the Father never takes a rest day. Why? Because if he takes a rest day, who will sustain creation and keep it going? So even on the Sabbath, the Father's working <clears throat> in that the Father is sustaining creation, giving life to creation, and provisions for all creatures. So the Father, by necessity, has to work on the Sabbath because he can't do otherwise because if he stops working, there's no life. Right? Do you get that point so far? Do you get that point so far? Focus. Okay. So then... Now, the Jews understand, okay, we know God keeps working. That we know. He has to. But then Jesus says, similarly, because he's my father, I'm his son, I'm working too. That's where they go live in. Because here's a flesh and blood Jew saying, just like the father has the right to work on this day, I too have that same right and work with him on this day. What? 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 You see why they thought he's blaspheming? In other words, the Jews are saying, look, we get the fact that God the Father works. That's his right, and he has to. Who do you think you are that you're saying, just like the Father works on this day, I, who happen to be his son, he happens to be my father, have the same right to work on this day as well. How dare you make that claim? But then he clarifies it. You understand why they understood he's claiming to be equal to the Father? He's saying, hold on, folks. Before you get out the stones, let me put in perspective. Though I work on the Sabbath, I do so in perfect union with the Father, in perfect union with His will, because as the Son, I never act contrary to Him, independently from Him. I do whatever He wants me to do, so know that I'm working on the Sabbath because that's what He wants me to do. Because I can only do what He wants me to do. You understand His point there? You understand? Let me prove that's what Jesus goes on to say. Let's read John 5, 19, because it's another passage that they misquote. John 5, 19, another passage that they misquote. Let's read. Let's break it down. John 5, 19. John 5, 19. Read with me. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. And they stopped there. See, he can't do anything by himself. But finish it. 
but that he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Wow. <whistles> Jesus says, I can't do a single thing on my own initiative. I can only do what the Father does. Whatever the Father does, I do likewise. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And you know what's beautiful? The New World Translation, Joseph Witnesses, translates this in a most remarkable way. Protestant believer, can you post the Jehovah Witness translation of John 5, 19? I have no idea what you're doing. Now, you just distracted me. Bring the word. No, you can't. Hold yourself and listen. Here's the Jehovah Witness translation, guys. Read Jehovah Witness translation of John 5, 19. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative. Not a single thing, but only what he sees the Father doing. Now notice their translation, how powerful it is. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son does also in like manner. Wow. That's even in their Bible, and they still don't get it. Now let me bring out the implication. Let me bring out the implication. Can a creature say he can only do what he sees God doing? No more, no less. Can a creature say that? Can a creature say, I can only do what I see God doing? No. We creatures do a lot of things that God doesn't do, right? A lot of things. We lie, we cheat, we steal, we're immoral, you name it. Even, you know, so a lot of things we do that God doesn't do. Okay, now. The second part of the question, can a creature say he can do whatever God does in the way God does them? I can do everything God does in the same way that God does them. Can a creature say that? But wait, folks, Jesus said, I can. I can only do what the Father does. I can't do anything but what the Father does. And whatever he does, I can do it in the same way he does it. That's what Jesus just said. Let's look at John 5, 19 again. Because he can only do what the Father wants him to do, Zena. That's a subornation. You keep thinking subornation means that he lacks the power that the Father has. Zena, let me explain it to you. Your boss, you can only do what your boss tells you to do or you get fired. So your boss says, punch in at 9. You punch in at 10, you get fired. So if you want to keep your job, you do what your boss tells you to do and only what your boss tells you to do. Because if you do something your boss doesn't want you to do, he fires you. Does that mean your boss is smarter than you, stronger than you, more human than you? Zena? Let me just, I uh, want her to answer. Does that mean your boss is smarter than you, better than you, more human than you? Because as an employee... You can only do what your boss tells you to do if you want to keep your job. I'm waiting for Zena. Yes, Zena. That's what Jesus said. I can only do what the Father does, and the Father gives me commandment of what I should say and speak. Here, let me prove it to you. Are you ready? John 12, 49 and 50. John 12, 49 and 50. Let me prove it to you. That's why he's the son, subject to the Father. John 12, 49, 50, Zena. Let's read. And that was John 5, 30 as well. But John 12, 49, 50 will read with me. For I have not spoken of myself. Pay attention, Zena. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment. What should I say and what I should speak? So he's told me what I should say and how to say it. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father sent unto me, so I speak. John 8, 28 and 29. John 8, 28 and 29. No side debates, medic. He's a brother in Christ. John 8, 28, but we're going to read 29 as well. John 8, 28 and 29. Then said Jesus unto them, pay attention, Zena. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he has sent me, is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Do you see what Jesus said? I am taught by the Father what to say. I only say what he wants me to say. 
And I always do what pleases him. Not sometime, not most of the time. I'm always pleasing the Father. I always delight the Father, and the Father is always delighted by me. Now, Zena, what creature can say that? No, Jason, Jesus was all-knowing on earth. Don't introduce another argument that I'm going to have to refute. Please, Jason, please. Okay. Okay. Yes, because he tells you he came down from heaven to do his will, not the son's will. John 6, 38, Zena. That's why you won't find in the Bible Jesus sending the Father or the Spirit sending the Father. It's the Father who sends the Son and the Spirit. Are you with me there, Zena? Are you getting it? See, John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is before Jesus became flesh. See, I even came down in obedience to his will. Because I can only obey him, always obey him, because my very love is to obey him. My delight is to obey him. My delight is to make him happy. And the Father's love is the Son and the Spirit. And the Father's delight is to make the Son and the Spirit happy. And the Spirit's delight is to make the Father and Son happy. You hear me there? Exactly, medic. Are you getting it now, Zena? But now, Zena and everyone else, what person can say, I always do what pleases the Father. I can only do what pleases the Father. And I only do what he tells me to do and say. And I can never say something contrary. And I can do everything he does. Can a creature say that? Yes, Sunil, there is a hierarchy. Stop getting distracted. The Father is the head. Oh, boy. All right. Now. So let's look at John 5.19 again. John 5.19 again. Okay. John 5.19. Let's read. Now let's read, Zena. They ans then answered, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I said unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever... He doeth these also, doeth the Son likewise. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? I can only do what the Father does, and I can do whatever the Father does, and the same way he does it. Wow. If Jesus is a creature, he just blasphemed. Because creatures cannot do everything the Father does the way the Father does them. Because the Father does things that only God can do. And Jesus says, yep, I can only do what he does, and everything he does, I can do in the same way. Does that sound like Jesus was denying he's God? So if I read John 5, 30 in the context, is Jesus denying he's God? Or is he saying, look, I am one with the Father and the Spirit. I can do whatever the Father and the Spirit do because I'm one with them in essence and power and ability. However, as the Son, I'm not independent of the Father and the Spirit. I'm one with the Father and the Spirit, and I can only act in perfect union with the Father and the Spirit and can never act indep independently. That's why they're one God and not three gods. Right? And I'm going to prove to you that's what Jesus is saying. Are we ready now? Are we ready? John 5, 20 to 21. Yep, Billy Mandalay, he's explaining the Godhead, that though all three are fully God, essentially God, equally God, they are not independent beings, but persons that are inseparable and can only work in perfect accord. Okay? John 5, 20 to 21. So if you understand the context, it's one of the most powerful proof texts that Jesus is God Almighty and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are inseparable because they're one God. One of the most powerful evidences for the Trinity and deity of Christ. And yet we let heretics misquote it and put us at the defensive. John 5, 20 to 21. Let's read. For the Father loveth the Son. He adores the Son. He delights in the Son. And showeth him all things that he himself does. Why? And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. The Father shows the Son everything he does because he's going to have the Son imitate him. Look, Son, I do this. You do it too. 
I create, you create with me. I give life, you give life with me. I raise the dead, you get because you're my son. I'm in love with you. You're one with me and the spirit. I love you both, and we all love each other and adore each other, and we do all things together. You see that? And here's the proof, 21. For as the Father, here, let me give you an example of what the Father does that I do likewise. As the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Wow. Like he raises the dead and gives life, I raise the dead and give life. In fact, not only do I raise the dead and give life like him, I am to be worshipped the same way he's worshipped. Yes, he can, friends. When you say verbally, he's a person like the Father and the Son. If the Father and Son can speak audibly, verbally, so can the Holy Spirit. And I gave you that in Acts 13, 2. The Holy Spirit was speaking audibly, verbally to the apostles. Acts 13, verse 2. Okay, now John 5, 22 to 23. Sunil, after I answer your question, brother, I'm tempted to block you. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, Sunil. Let's see. Are you... Co-equal to your dad? Sunil, hold on. Hold on, guys. Are you co-equal to your dad, Sunil? You're not, huh? So you're a dog and your dad is human. So you're inferior in nature. So you're a dog, right? So why are you here talking? So let me repeat it again. Are you co-equal to your dad? Yeah, you're going to get blocked. Are you co-equal to your dad? Yeah, this guy's about to get blocked. Yeah. Don't answer for him, Zena, please. So you're not okay, Sunil. Then if, since you're not co-equal, that means you're not human. You're you're a dog, and I don't preach the dog. So bye bye. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. No, sorry, Eriotai. I'm going to block you too, bro. Okay, I'm going to block you too. Sorry. Okay, now for the rest of you who understand. Okay, I'm going to use Zina again. Zina, are you co-equal to your mother? Hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Let me walk through this because I want everyone to end. This is why it kills me. See, again, here's, here's, here's my problem, folks. The church in America and in Europe has done such a bad job in teaching the faith that we have such level of ignorance that people can't understand basic Christian doctrine. And you know who God is going to hold accountable? The pastors who are fleecing the flock and not teaching them the word. Isn't it disgusting, folks? Here, isn't it disgusting? You guys have to come on YouTube. You have to find YouTube channels, teachers to teach you the word of God in depth as opposed to getting this from your local church and from your local pastor who's supposed to be teaching you this every week. Right? You with me there? Isn't it sad and disgusting? You need to, but find a solid church. Okay, now coming back to the issue. Coming back to the issue. Zena, I'm going to use you. You want me to block you, Zena? I can. Zena J, I'll be more than happy to. Zena M, here's my question for you. Zena M, are you ready? Here's my question. Are you equal to your mother? Are you equal to your mother? Thank you. So you're fully human. You may be smarter than your mo mother, stronger than your mother, more intelligent, right? But are you subordinate subject to your mother? What's discussing? Are you subject to your mother? Zina, bye-bye. Get lost. Zina at J. No one asked you. So stop whining and telling us what you're going to do. Get lost. Okay, so, right? Hold on. Let me help you. I'm going to block you. I'll make it easy for you. Oh, she's already blocked, so why is she here? Block her, folks. Please, someone block this nuisance. She wants attention. <laughs> All right. Now, Zena, so there's a hierarchy in your family. Though your mother and you are equal in essence and nature and value, 
she still has authority over you. So there's a hierarchy. So you see how you can be equal in one way and have a hierarchy in another way? Right? You with me there? You can be equal in one way, but have a hierarchy in another way. Your mother is your head, even though you may be smarter than her, stronger than her, right? Make more money than her. And the time will come where she'll depend on you to cook for her, clean, and change her due to her old age. But because she's your mother, she'll always have authority over you. And if you dishonor her, God will dishonor you. So you're equal to your mother in essence, nature, and value, but subject to her in authority. Right? Are you with me there? Okay. Now, who's the oldest in your family? Are you the oldest? Who's the oldest? Okay, who's the oldest? Zina, who's the oldest? I don't mind answering sincere questions, but I want to know who's the oldest in your family. Okay, how old is he? Give me his age. How old is he? Give me his age. Not his name or social security, even though I want his bank account because I need money. Yeah. 42. Okay, 42. Okay, here's my question. Your mother, how old is she? Choose and Zena, they're related, so... Right? Not by choice. They're proof of the predestination. How old is your mother? Guys, where, watch where I'm going with this. Is she 62? No. Your mother is not 62 because she hasn't been a mother for 62 years. So you're not listening. I said mother. I didn't ask whether your mother as a human being is 62 years old. I said mother. As a mother, she's only as old as the firstborn. Because without a child, you're not a parent. So your mother is 42 years old. In other words, your mother only became a mother when she had a child. And the firstborn made her a parent. So your mother is 42 years old as the firstborn is 42 years old. So what's my point? God the Father is an eternal father. But for him to be an eternal father, he has to have an eternal son to be an actual father. So Jesus, the son, is just as old as his father, even though his father has authority over him. You got it? I'm crazy? Okay, thank you. You got it? The eternal father, who is an actual father, doesn't become a father, was the eternal father to his firstborn. And its firstborn is Jesus. So Jesus, the firstborn son of God, has to be as old as the father. Because if there is no son, then there is no father. That means God was simply a father in potential and only actualized his fatherhood when he created, which means he needs creation. But God needs nothing to be who he is. Right? Focus, don't get into side talks. Get rid of don't, don't, because he don't be speaking. You with me there? So let's try this again. Let's go with your son, your brother, Zina. Your brother, the firstborn, is 42 years old. How old is your mother? How old is your mother? Okay. How old is your father? How old is your father? 42. Okay. So notice, just as your, your brother needed your parents to be alive, your parents needed him to be parents. You see, they're interdependent. He needed them to come to life, and they need him to be parents. Because before he was born, they were not parents. So your dad and mom and the firstborn are of the same age. He makes them parents and they gave him his life. You with me there? So God the Father needs the Son to be God the Father. And the Son needs the Father to be the Son. 
So they're interdependent and need one another to be who they are. Are you getting in here or no? You're getting it here or no? No, he's not a female. Why would you bring me in? Bert, you know, I got to send you on your merry way. Bye-bye, Bert. Now, can you tell me why that question was brought up? Okay, Bert, sorry. I'm sorry, man. You're not listening. You keep saying stuff. I'm sorry, man. You know, I love you, right? But not that much. Oh, he's blocked already. Get rid of him, please. Block him. Notice these guys. I've got them blocked. They still come anyway. Get rid of them. Okay, do you understand? You with me there? The father needs Jesus the son to be the father. You're going to get next. You're going to go next but compilation. Complain one more time. Say it one time. Complain. What was it? I don't think you know my policy. You don't need to be here. I didn't ask you to come. You want to come here? I'll serve you. If you don't like it, I got to block you. Say it one more time. Come on. There are other teachers that God will use in your life. You don't need me. Jesus doesn't need me. Okay? Don't complain of how I run a tight ship. No, no, no. I'm going to chill you out and muzzle you because you're being stupid enough to tell me chill. Don't come back. See, these guys are idiots. They think they're going to come here and talk stupid. Oh, he's blocked too, this clown, this dog. Send him on his merry way. Another dog that was blocked. Let me repeat again. You don't like it? Don't come here. You don't need me. Jesus doesn't need me. If the Lord wants to use me to bless you, amen. I run a tight ship. I need to maintain order. Don't like it? Bye, bye, Miss American Pie. Do my Chevy to the lip. All right. Okay, let's get back to the point. Let's get back to the point. God the Father needs Jesus to be an actual father, and Jesus needs the Father to be who he is. You see the interdependency? They need one another, which is why they're inseparable, and they can't be who they are apart from the other. The Father can't be who he is apart from the Son and the Spirit. The Son can't be who he is apart from the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit can't be who he is apart from the Father and the Son. All three persons need one another to be who they are to make up the one God. Right? Do you get it? Making sense? Sinking in? Did it make sense? But just as Zena's mother has authority over her, there's a hierarchy. Just as Zena's father has authority over her firstborn or her brother, the firstborn, there's a hierarchy. So too, there's a hierarchy father, son, and spirit. Father's the head of the son and the spirit. The son is the head of the spirit. So there's a hierarchy, even though they're equal in essence, nature, power, and glory. There's a hierarchy in Zena's family, even though the parents and the siblings are all equal in nature, essence, and glory. And that's why even your firstborn, the firstborn son, has authority over you and the other children, Zena, because of his status as the firstborn, because he made your parents parents. You didn't make them parents. The brother, the firstborn, made them parents. Right? Did it make sense now, Zena? I can multiply this in different spheres of our life. Your boss, Zena, your boss or your teacher, your boss has authority over you. There's a hierarchy at your work, your employment. Your boss and you, but that doesn't mean your boss is more human than you and better than you. So you see, I can go on and on and on, but it makes sense now, right? And that's the beauty of the Bible. It's simple that a child can get it, but so deep that it blows the, the mind of the most brilliant human creature, even angelic creature. Simple that a child can get it, but so profound and deep that even the most brilliant of sentient creatures will be lost in its profound depth and beauty. If you call him Father, Jason, then people thinking that you're calling him God the Father. So you run a risk of confusing people into thinking you're a modalist heretic who worships Jesus as God the Father. All right? And beyond that, could you call Adam Eve? Because Adam and Eve are one flesh, basar achat. So I can say, Adam, hey, Eve. Okay, now let's finish John 5, 22, 23. Let's finish it. 
And this will be it for me. John 5, 22 to 23. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now notice that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. Now notice what Jesus did not say. Guys, pay attention now. Notice what Jesus did not say. God the Father wants you to honor me, the Son, like you honor your parents, like you honor your master, like you honor a prophet. No, 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 no. The Father himself wants you to give me the same honor that you give the Father. But wait, Jesus. The honor I give to the Father is that I worship him. I love him more than anything, more than my own life. And I'm willing to die for him. And my money is his. My job is to bring him glory. My children, everything is to glorify him. And I have to love him more than anything, more than my children, more than my life, more than my bank account. Unconditionally, more than me, more than anything. And I am to pray to him, sing to him, right? Worship him. Are you saying I'm supposed to give you that same honor? Yes. You honor me the way you honor the Father. So if you pray to the Father, you pray to me. If you sing to the Father, you sing to me. If you love the Father more than anything, more than your possession, more than your life, and you're willing to die for him, you have to love me the same way with the Father. You are to love me more than anything, more than anyone, more than your life, more than your possession, and be willing to give it all up, even your life, for me. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You want me there? You with me there? And now let me give you proof from Scripture that every created thing in existence is supposed to give Jesus the exact worship that the Father receives. Let me give you the proof from Scripture. Revelation 5, verse 13. Let's read in the Jehovah Witness translation. Revelation 5, 13. Revelation 5, 13, Jehovah Witness translation. Almost done. And, I'll, and then, Lord willing, good news tomorrow. By faith, Father, Son, Spirit, please, in Jesus' name, because of your grace, a good report tomorrow, favor for me and my daughters tomorrow, please, in Jesus' name. Revelation 5.13, New World Translation, folks, pay attention. Use this verse against them in their own Bible. Read, read with me. And I heard every creature, not some, John exhausts the language, every creature, and if you didn't get it, every creature in heaven, Okay, John, and on earth, oh, underneath the earth and on the sea and all things in them. Wow, John, you really want us to get the point. Every creature in the entire creation, right? Yes, every creature that exists everywhere. Heaven, earth, underneath the earth, the sea, all things in them. Every creature in the entire created order. Okay, John, what about them? What did you hear? I heard every creature in existence saying to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb, bam, be the blessing and the glory and the honor and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. Amen. Wow. John, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, sees every creature in the entire creation, in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth, see all things in them, myself included, all creation, giving the Lamb, Jesus, the same blessing, honor, glory that they give to the Father. Wow. And this is in the Jehovah Witness Bible. This establishes two things, folks. Jesus is not a mere creature. Why? Because every created thing is separated from the Father and the Son. Every created thing is on one side. Jesus is distinct from the entire creation, and he's on the side of the Father. And Jesus is worshipped to the same degree to the same extent, for the same duration that the Father is worshipped by every created thing in existence. One of the most powerful passages showing Jesus is eternal, uncreated by nature, equal to the Father in glory, majesty, and honor. Clear? That's John 5, 22, 23. Let's finish it. Let's read 25, 26. We're going to finish it with John 5, 25 to 26. Okay, hold on. And then 28 to 29. Let's, let's look at it. John 5, 25, 26, 28, 29. Read with me and we're done. 
Most truly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and it is now, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Notice, they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who have paid attention will live. This is a Jehovah Witness translation. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted also to the, to the Son to have life in himself. And now 28, 29. Do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice. Verse 25 tells us, his voice, the voice of the Son of God. All in the tombs, in the graves, will hear the voice of the Son of God and come out those who did good things to a resurrection of life and those who practice vile things to a resurrection of judgment. Wow. Okay, wait. Jesus says, I, the Son of God, will raise the dead spiritually and physically. I'll raise them physically from their graves at the last hour by the sound of my voice. What kind of attributes must Jesus possess to be able to give spiritual life and physically resurrect dead bodies to stand before him in judgment, what kind of attributes must he have? He has to be all-powerful. Notice how powerful, how majestic, how beautiful his voice is, that just by his voice, he raises the dead physically and spiritually because that's the same voice that brought all creation into existence from nothing. That voice. But I gotta repent. You with me there? All powerful. Those of you who heard a saying I just said, I'm gonna beat someone else in love and repentance. And he must be present everywhere to be able to know where the dead are and then raise them. So wait, guys. Okay, wait. Let's read John 5:30 now, in light of what we just read. John 5:30, in light of what we just read. Pray. My YouTube channel exceeds the 10,000 mark. We need to get it over 10,000 and hit the like button. Uh, Raphael, I could care less what they say because if you don't know how to refute that, then that's your problem because this is a refutation in of itself. So the Father is honoring Jesus to do things that only Jehovah does according to the Old Testament, even though he's a creature. Okay, Raphael, good, good thinking. John 5.30, let's read. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So now in light of verses 16 to 29, in light of verses 16 to 29, you're going to dare quote verse 30 to show that Jesus was claiming to be a creature, limited, and not God. In light of what we just read from 16 to 29, the same chapter where Jesus says, I have the same right to work on the Sabbath that only the Father has, meaning God. I have the same right he does. So I, with the Father, have that same right to work on the Sabbath. I can only do what the Father does. Whatever the Father does, I can do in the same way he does it. So just like the Father raised the dead, I raise the dead. Just as the Father gives life, I give life. Just as the Father has life in himself so that he's the source of life, I have life in myself because with the Father, I'm the source of life. And everyone must worship me the same way they worship the Father. And at the sound of my majestic voice, I will raise the dead spiritually and physically from their graves at the last hour. All of that in that chapter. All of that that came before verse 30. And you're going to quote verse 30 to prove that Jesus said he's a creature who's limited. He's not God. Seriously? That's what you're going to do? Really? That's what you're going to do? Honestly, you see why I get angry and I have no respect for Bible perverts who pervert the Bible on any subject, and I go for the juggler and insult them, belittle them, humiliate them, especially when they refuse to accept correction? How dare you pervert the Bible like this? How dare you distort it and demean Jesus and rob Jesus of the glory he deserves when even the Father says, you better honor my son the way you honor me? Because my son, like me, is God Almighty, and he's the reason why you exist. Like me, he's your creator, life giver, and you better honor him as such. And you dare rob him of that honor and make him less than he is? How dare you? Right? Clear? Anyway, with that said, we're done for tonight. Hopefully, in Jesus' name, by faith in the goodness of our Lord and His grace. I don't deserve it, but for the sake of my daughters, we'll have a good report. 9.30 a.m. 
Central Standard Time. Good report. And hopefully, in Jesus' name, I'll be back tomorrow night celebrating with you. His will is perfect. No matter what it is, I accept it. But ask the Lord to set me free so I can have no more courts and these satanic distractions so I can focus on God, worshiping God, loving God, obeying God, living for God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, preaching the word of God until I die. And pray the Lord will provide for me and through me for my daughters, that he'll bless this YouTube channel for his glory, the websites and the articles, and use me more and send me out more because God willing, next week I'm out to a conference and I'm going to teach at a seminar in Jesus' name. So pray for me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Fight for us and save us, Lord, please. And fight for my daughters and bring them to me. I love them, Lord. They're your gifts to me. Thank you. We love you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.